Season 1 of Doctor Who is finally here, and last weekend saw not one, but two episodes drop on BBC iPlayer and Disney+. Plus. Today I'm taking a look at those episodes in a bit more detail. This review will contain spoilers, so if you haven't watched Doctor Who yet, go and watch it, then come back here. So first off, let's start with Space Babies. Before we jump into talking about the episode, I just want to say the title sequence looks absolutely fantastic. I know that quite a lot of fans weren't happy with the title sequence during the specials, and that's mostly because the Doctor Who logo looks really flat. Doctor Who PNG. So Doctor Who PNG, Doctor Who Pung is no more. The logo's received a really nice fancy render. And also the shot where we jump out slightly and see the TARDIS from the side has been improved as well. So overall the title sequence is looking lovely. So I know a lot of people found Space Babies a bit silly. I actually think this is really in keeping with Russell T Davis's openers. As you know, Doctor Who can go to some really silly places. Come on, like the adipose. Slitheen. We've seen it all before. And so Space Babies doesn't really feel that alien to me. And Doctor Who can go to some pretty dark places too. Let's face it, these babies are stuck on this spaceship which is running out of air. And the bogeyman is actually one of the children, like a deformed child. That's really, really dark. So personally for me, I didn't find it too silly. I found it really fun. And actually it's really nice to just step away from really in-depth plots and kind of like just go back to basics and have a really simple Doctor Who episode. And I must say, I think it was really clever of the BBC or whoever was scheduling the episodes to do the double bill, because I think that really shows new viewers the vast differences that you can expect in Doctor Who episodes. Doctor Who is a genre hopper, as we know, so one week we've got Space Babies, the next week we're in 1960s London and music has been stolen and there's an amazing Disney-esque villain and yeah so you know every week it's going to be different. One of the things I love most about this episode was the way that they reintroduce all of Doctor Who's concepts. So for example the TARDIS, the chameleon circuit, why the TARDIS is stuck as a police box, what the TARDIS is, who the Doctor is, the Doctor's backstory and I think that's really great for new viewers jumping on board and let's face it this is series one or season one we're calling this season one so we're kind of starting again. This is like the reboot of the reboot. So a lot of new people are expected to jump on board. So I think it's really good that they covered that off. And Ruby gets a TARDIS key as well. And normally we have to wait several episodes for that to happen. So, you know, they really are moving fast in their relationship. And again, at the start of the episode, they land in prehistoric times and see dinosaurs. And that just demonstrates to new viewers in the first few minutes of the episode, the crazy places you can go in the TARDIS. Just to speak about the dinosaur scene in a bit more detail, obviously Ruby steps on a butterfly and the Doctor is able to heal it somehow and then history goes back to normal. And this is something we haven't really seen in Doctor Who before. And I think this might hint to the overarching themes of this series, which are to do with mythical things becoming reality. And we'll touch on this again a bit later on in this review. It's either that or it simply is just a funny gag. So going back to Space Babies, I really liked when they landed on the ship how Ruby's reaction to space seems really genuine to me. You know, she really is taken aback by the scene of, you know, space beneath her. It really reminded me of the scene in Rose where Rose is looking out in the end of the world across space and she really can't believe her eyes. And actually Russell's reused a couple of things from Rose. So for example, the phone so he kind of tampers with her phone so she's able to call her mum and she actually does that and that is exactly what happens in Rose. Some people might think that this was a bit lazy, that they shouldn't really be reusing stuff but I actually think this is too good to reuse. I think this really hits home just how far away from home she is and you know going back to new viewers as well I think this is just it's too good to waste. And you know, it was 20 years ago, so I think they can get away with it. And to me, Millie and Shooty's chemistry is amazing from the get-go. They've just really clicked into place instantly. I love their chemistry. I love how they are with each other. They're just having fun. They're really young, fresh, energetic, and it really has breathed new life into the show for me. So when the Space Babies appeared, I have to say, it did take me a while to get past the CGI mouths. When they first appeared, I just thought, what is this? Like, I just don't know if I can get past this. But I managed to see past it. And I think after a few minutes of watching the babies, my brain kind of adjusted and got used to it. But I have to say at first, I wasn't that on board. And they are really sweet with the babies. I think that day on set must have been really, really cute. Uh, some of the babies look 
a bit sad. Like the main baby, Eric, uh, is really frowny and it kind of like is a bit weird when the CGI mouth is like smiling, but his eyes are really frowny. Um, but I think that just adds to the weirdness of the episode. And you know, it's it's Doctor Who, it can, it can afford to be a bit silly. One part that I particularly liked in the Doctor's interaction with the babies was his little pep talk uh, to the captain. I think she's like the captain um, of the babies and um, he talks about his origin. And to be honest, I actually didn't like the Timeless Child storyline when it first appeared. I'm someone who doesn't think that we should really delve into the Doctor's origin. I've always liked that, you know, the Doctor is a bit of a mystery. The Doctor's someone who came from this planet Gallifrey and ran away. And that's kind of like all we know. So at first I didn't really like that they had addressed this in the show, but it looks like Russell is doing things to build on this. I think it's really nice as well. The Doctor is starting to talk about himself as adopted, as an orphan. I'm actually a care leaver myself, so I grew up in foster care and I really like the conversations they're having about found families and about feeling different and about how, you know, everyone's a little bit different, but everyone is accepted and, you know, it doesn't mean that you're like an odd one out or something. So I really like where they're going with this. And obviously Ruby being in foster care, having a foster mum herself, um, is great. You know, I really love that representation and it really means a lot to me that they've explored this in the show as well. And speaking of Ruby, they are setting up quite a lot in this episode about what's to come later on. We've got that scene where the memory of the night she was born starts to bleed through and you see snowflakes on the ship. And this is something that comes back in the Devil's Cord as well, the snowflakes. So this is definitely heading somewhere. And obviously there's an episode called The Legend of Ruby Sunday coming up as well. So we are definitely going to find out a bit more about her origin. We also get some other teasers in the episode as well. You might have noticed on the screen in the nanny's room, but that's actually Susan Twist. Susan Twist is an actress who keeps popping up in Doctor Who. She's popped up in Wobbly Yonder, The Church on Ruby Road, Space Babies. She's popped up in The Devil's Cord as the dinner lady. And she can also be seen in the teaser clip at the end of Doctor Who Unleashed for Boom. We're obviously going to see a lot more of her as the series goes on. And I think this is building up to something towards the end where Susan Twist is actually playing an important character, potentially the head of S Triad Technologies, as we've seen in the trailer. And also I did spot a Disney Plus trailer where she's dressed as a businesswoman and she says Doctor Who. So I think she might be one of the big villains at the end of the series. Is she the one who waits? I don't think she is. I think the one who waits might be her boss. I think the one who waits is definitely something bigger, much, much bigger. And I'm not sure Susan Twist's character is really related to Susan Foreman. I think this would be too obvious. I don't think she's like her child or something. I think she's a completely different character. I did see a theory in my Instagram comment saying that Susan might be a chosen name to lure the Doctor in. We shall see. So that brings us to the end of Space Babies. All in all, I did really enjoy the episode. I remember when the credits rolled, I thought, that's strong. That was my kind of instant reaction. I thought, okay, that's strong. That, you know, that feels like a, a good, strong first episode for the series. I do think it was good that they aired The Devil's Chord though at the same time, because we are going to talk about that next. And that was my favorite episode of the two by far. So first things first, let's talk about Maestro. Maestro played by Jinx Monsoon. That performance was just absolutely incredible. I have to say, I didn't know what to expect. I haven't really seen Jinx Monsoon in Drag Race. I'm not really caught up with Drag Race. So I did go into this blind, but Jinx Monsoon just chewed up the scenery around her. She was just absolutely fantastic. I actually found Maestro very sinister. There were moments that felt really dark and really creepy, particularly where Maestro's eating the notes and does it in a does it in a really i don't know like a really creepy way it's just creepy and then later on when ruby is tangled up maestro has like black around their lips which is really creepy because obviously maestro has been gorging on notes musical notes i think the other thing that was really creepy for me was the way that maestro was able to shift from kind of really loud and outgoing to like just really angry and you know intense and scary a bit like how missy is really unpredictable so you had moments where maestro was kind of like all like 
you know performing and kind of singing and then like screaming and then shouting and that character just seems really unhinged to me and uh yeah I was I was pretty creeped out and I think this might be a good point in the video to talk about Disney and Disney's involvement in the series now I can't speak for obviously the BBC or Disney plus I don't know how much influence Disney have over the series but I must say Maestro for me does fit in really well to the sort of Disney-esque characters. Maestro to me did really feel like a Disney villain and I kind of think it works. It is different for Doctor Who. We are used to Doctor Who feeling a little bit more kind of sci-fi and for this series Doctor Who has kind of taken a turn into the sort of fantastical but I do think it's working and it is adding something new to the show so it'll be interesting to see what the other gods are like that appear in the series and Russell actually has said that there are going to be at least three more gods he actually hinted to that in a interview that I found today it will be interesting to see what they are and what they're the god of and speaking of the mystical and the fantastical this brings me to some of the weirdest stuff that's been happening in the series not just in this episode but actually since the church on ruby road and I'm actually going to turn to my notes here because there have been a few things so there's been a few times now where the Doctor's broken the fourth wall. Obviously at the beginning of The Devil's Chord we had the theme tune being played for Doctor Who, which is a bit unusual. If you go back to last year, we had Mrs. Flood, who breaks the fourth wall and says, you know, never seen a TARDIS before, which is, again, really odd and that hasn't been addressed yet. And actually I want to call out a theory by Tharys on YouTube, which I watched earlier today. Definitely go and check his video out, but basically Tharys has this theory that this series is all part of a TV show, so a bit like the Truman Show, and perhaps we are headed for a god which is the god of, I don't know, TV, the god of performance. And uh, the Doctor and uh, Ruby are sort of stuck in this uh, show, which could explain quite a lot of things. So it would be interesting to see if that's true. I think that'd be really fun. I think that would be really meta. And again, I want to talk about the chemistry between the Doctor and Ruby. In this episode, they are just absolutely fantastic together. Again, it's so much fun to see them at the beginning of the episode, selecting outfits and just having an absolute blast. This is the exact sort of energy we need in the show, I think. And, you know, the companion is someone who is supposed to represent us. We're kind of seeing the Doctor's world through their eyes. And it's lovely to see Ruby, the character, just really enjoying herself and really enjoying the experience. And she's really getting into it and she's really enjoying being part of the Doctor's world. And of course, 1963 looks absolutely fantastic. The outfits that they've chosen and just everything about the aesthetic, it looks really, really cool. There were a few scenes that didn't look that amazing, particularly the scenes where the neighbors are looking out their windows. It does feel a bit like a theater set. But then I did take a step back from that and I thought, well, actually, if this is a, an episode all about music and performance, it kind of feels like, a, I don't know, a movie set sometimes or a theater set. Maybe that was just my way of explaining it. But I thought that was really cool. It kind of added something to it. And of course, it was really cool to see the Beatles in an episode. I have to say, I'm not 100% on board with the casting. I think that they didn't really look that much like their characters. I think the John Lennon one is really good, but the Paul McCartney, uh, the similarity for me isn't really there. It's kind of there, but I can see past that. It was a great episode, so yeah, it's cool. Susan Twist makes another appearance as a dinner lady and the Doctor doesn't notice again. It seems that the Doctor and Ruby are always turning around when she's there. There's something about her. I don't know. It's definitely headed to something, as I mentioned earlier, so it will be interesting to see where this takes us and when we'll see her again. One of my favorite bits about the episode was the bit where it goes completely silent. So all of the noise, all of the sound is taken away. I thought this was really cool. I really love it when Doctor Who plays with the format and plays with things and taking the sound away completely really added to the intensity of the scene. But also, I don't know if you've noticed, but there actually isn't any Murray Gold in the episode. The only music that you hear is the music generated by the characters, so I thought that was really cool as well. To be honest, once they start facing off against Maestro, not that much happens in terms of plot. It kind of seems to be all building up to this encounter with Maestro, and then they have a music battle, and then uh, the Beatles sort of help the Doctor save the day. So it's not really very plot heavy, but to be honest, I didn't mind that so much because the visuals were just amazing, the performances were just amazing. And I absolutely loved that musical number at the end. It was just doing something different. And I really, really appreciated that. And I think it's interesting that the Doctor actually doesn't win. It's actually the Beatles who help the Doctor 
solve the arrangement of notes that actually get Maestro banished. The Doctor isn't able to do this on his own. I think it's good to show the Doctor someone who ultimately isn't invincible, because otherwise the show would be really boring. And especially as we're getting these godlike characters, those characters do need to feel invincible for them to be threatening otherwise it's just going to make for a really boring show and I think it goes back to actually the Doctor is someone who really is alien and sometimes the Doctor does need that little bit of human to solve the day and you know and that's what happens in this episode I think it's really important to keep the stakes high in Doctor Who I do remember during Matt Smith's era where he points at the sky and tells all of the aliens to go away he's like I am the Doctor look me up or something and it's like Daleks Jadoon like Cybermen probably like all of these villains and they just go and I just I remember at that point thinking you know the doctor's got too powerful so I think it's really important that the doctor you know isn't someone who is invincible and you know needs to be challenged every week and finally I did touch on the song a little bit I really enjoyed this this was an absolute surprise I suspected we might get like a musical episode I think it was really good that we actually got just one musical number at the end. So that brings us to the end of the review. Those are my brief thoughts on Space Babies and The Devil's Chord. I'd love to know what you guys thought of the episode, so let me know in the comments below. I'll be back next week for a review of Boom, so make sure you're subscribed and turn on notifications to get it first. Until then, have a good week, and I'll see you soon.